Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, at the Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Library Commission's weekly online event where we cover various commission activities and anything that may be of interest to Nebraska librarians. We have topics presented by guest speakers and NLC staff, which is who, what we have today. Um, we do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time Live. Um, and we do a mixture of anything, presentations, interviews, web tours, mini trainings, um, whatever. And they are all recorded, so if you do not make it to one of our live sessions, you can watch any of the um, recordings that we have now. Um, almost two years worth. We started Ooh, this in January 2009. Many. Yes. <laughs> um, and also, thank you very much, everyone, who showed up today, the day before Thanksgiving, <laughs> showed up live for our session. That's great. We're here. So we're glad we're that you're here with us. Yes. Uh, today we have um, Michael Sowers, our um, technology innovation librarian, my mind blanked, at the <laughs> Library Commission, um, who does a week, wait, monthly, monthly tech talk with us for this. And this is his monthly one for mm -hmm. November. And I'll just let you take it away. Take it away. Michael, okay. Yes. I can leave the room. No. 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 Oh. Oh. Take it away. I have no oh, idea what you're talking. About. Figurative. What you want to talk about. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Krista. Uh, I think we're in rare form today. This, this could be interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, as Krista said, I'm Michael Sowers, technology innovation librarian here at the commission, and I do these once a month, usually on the last Wednesday of the month. Um, although we, to, you know, can move it around if necessary due to other issues. Um, and typically, I have somebody, uh, kind of a guest speaker interviewee for uh, the session. And this month, I don't. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> um, not due to lack of trying uh, um, or finding anybody. But um, there have just been two kind of topics that I thought really um, I wanted our listeners and watchers to be aware of. Uh, and to deal with, and I figured that would take the majority of the time to, to explain them well. So I'm going to basically focus on those two topics today, kind of do the, um, the, the show myself. Um, and the first one has to do with some news in the Wi-Fi security worlds uh, that will affect if you are offering public access Wi-Fi to your patrons in your library. And uh, the other one is QR codes, which some people may have seen my presentation at the NLA conference, but uh, I'm noticing we have a lot of people not from Nebraska and some people may not have been there. And um, on my way home from a recent conference, I saw something that said, um, I think I need to take this on and tell more people about it. So yeah. that'll be kind of the second half. So with that, um, what I would like to do to start with is I have a couple little uh, survey questions of our audience. And so the first question is, do you offer a free public Wi-Fi in your library? And if you do, if you could use the check mark uh, in um, go to meeting, we have the check mark, right? Or don't we? Did I screw this up? Okay, raise your hand in uh, go to meeting if you are offering free public Wi-Fi to yeah, your that'll patrons. Work. That'll work, okay. Um, this is called Michael didn't check the interface before he wrote <laughs> the slide this morning. Okay, so pretty much... Um, everybody. everybody. All right. But, well, Us. <laughs> no, there's one other person. Oh, uh, one other person who's uh, not. Okay. Okay. So all but one. Okay. That's good. Okay. okay. Great. So my next question is, is do you, uh, so I'm going to clear everybody's hands here. Okay. Let me put that down. Okay. So next question. Do you require a password to access your public Wi-Fi, your open Wi-Fi? So if the answer is yes to that question, please go ahead and raise your hands. Raise your hand again. Yeah, again, please. And I'm going to sort by raised hands here, and I'm seeing two. All right, okay. So where am I going with this? Okay, a little bit of background, and I'm going to remember my, okay, so we're going to stay here for a second. <clears throat> I've done a lot of work here in the state of Nebraska with getting Wi-Fi um, into public libraries for the public. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, a couple of years ago, uh, after I moved to Nebraska, I've been here almost four years, I, I saw a sign in a Wendy's uh, along I-80 that said uh, free Wi-Fi available here. Uh, I've also seen uh, a few years back in Salt Lake City, I saw a sign uh, for free Wi-Fi while you wait at a muffler shop. And, okay. and after seeing these signs, I thought about it and I said, okay, really, um, the public library needs to be offering public Wi-Fi. 
And so we got a grant together here in Nebraska, and we ended up with uh, 43 additional libraries, got some laptops mm -hmm. and some Wi-Fi equipment, and we opened it up. And we've got, from what I can tell, a, a pretty good pre, uh, uh, penetration of public access Wi-Fi here in Nebraska at, at the, our public libraries. And one of the questions that always come up when a public library offers uh, open Wi-Fi is, should I put a password on it? And up until two or so weeks ago, my answer was, no, don't bother. Okay. And here's why. Um, basically, the idea behind uh, securing your Wi-Fi. Now, if you're doing this at home, you want to do that. You put a password on it, and that way, only the people who have the password can get on the Wi-Fi. And so that way, my neighbors can't be using my Internet connection. This makes perfect sense. Um, it will also protect you from people snooping on your connection, okay, which, will, which is a very good idea, which we'll get back to in a moment. Um, but <clears throat> in a public library situation, if you um, secure the Wi-Fi, then you have to give everybody the password. Okay? And the analogy, which, which still does hold to a certain extent, giving everybody the password to the Wi-Fi is like locking your house and then giving everybody a key. <laughs> It's no longer really that secure if anybody can get in. So go ahead, leave the Wi-Fi unsecured, and tell your patrons through some sort of policy or login screen that, by the way, people, uh, you are using an open Wi-Fi connection. This is usually what you get also in a Starbucks or, or anywhere else. It's very common. Um, and that people who really know what they're doing can snoop on what you're doing over a public Wi-Fi. So, you know, don't do your banking over unsecured Wi-Fi, that sort of thing. Or make sure you're using a website that has its own security. Okay, and I'll give an example here. Um, this is Dropbox, which is a service I use to share files online. And as you can see by the red arrow in the upper left there, I'm logging in with HTTPS, and I have that um, lock icon there. Now, depending on your browser, this may vary a little bit how it looks. But basically, I am now using a secure connection to Dropbox. This is the login screen. And then once I'm logged in, you'll notice that um, it is still listed as HTTPS. So Sometimes that little lock thing is like in the lower right corner of the browser. Right, so yeah. It yeah. so depends on... You might have a look around to see where that little symbol is. Exactly. I think in IE, it might be in the bottom. And again, depending on your version of IE. Of um, Firefox, I think it's off to the right of the address bar. This is Chrome. But if you look for the lock, you look for HTTPS. And what, what's going on here is that Dropbox is using a secure connection during your whole interaction with the website, the whole time. And this is good. I could now safely use this over an open Wi-Fi connection because it is secure. It's encrypting the transmission. And if somebody was to pull my signal out of the air, which you can do because this is just radio, they wouldn't be able to tell what I'm doing. Okay, that's a good thing. However, not all websites work that way. Show you another example. Here is Amazon. Okay? And Amazon, you'll notice I'm on the login screen for Amazon, and this is HTTPS. Okay? Nice and secure. That's good. Trouble is, once I'm logged in and I start surfing around in Amazon, notice what has disappeared from this URL. There's no HTTPS there anymore. I've now it's it's verified my identity securely, but I'm now surfing around the site unsecurely. And the question is, and I, I'm, I'm going to get technical here, folks. So if you've got questions, raise your hand. Oh, it is tech. Yeah, it is tech talk. <laughs> but I, I usually don't get this geeky about you know, how things work behind the scenes. On a lot of websites, Amazon included, it will verify your identity securely. So nobody can figure out what my password is mm -hmm. because that was done securely. But then once I'm surfing around the website, what it's done is it, it has placed a cookie on my computer to say, you're now Michael. And we know that. And, and we know that, but it drops out of a secure connection. It's now back to an unsecure connection, okay, until you want to go, like, actually buy something, mm -hmm. okay? Now, this happens on other websites, too, such as Facebook, mm -hmm. such as Twitter in some cases. Now, this is starting to change literally as we talk because of what I'm getting to with all of this. Okay. So what is the logic of a website? Why? Why would they do that? Make you secure, then not, then again. Well, okay. Um, it's it's kind of a historical issue, um, and there's there, we we can get even more technical. But what what 
historically these websites w was that secure connections are more processor and bandwidth intensive. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Now that being said, Google Mail went all secure all the time about six months ago, mm -hmm. and they've kind of proven that it's no longer processor intensive. Mm -hmm. There's still bandwidth issues, which I, I don't really want to get into. Yeah. But th there have been reasons to not be secure in the past to kind of make everything run a little smoother. Those reasons seem to have gone away with the advancement of technology. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you got to do a lot of back end changes to turn everything secure again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's there's work involved. Okay. All right. In essence, this has generally kind of been the way things have worked. Okay. Then several weeks ago, a piece of software was released, okay? and that piece of software is called Fire Sheep. And there's my sheep. I just I found that sheep. <laughs> I like it. Notice he's kind of looking at that Wi-Fi over there. Okay. Fire Sheep was released at a security conference by a security expert, basically to prove a point. Okay. Now what I've mentioned is that on unsecured Wi-Fi, everything's kind of in the clear. And you really had to have some know-how to figure out what people are doing over this open Wi-Fi. The, the software existed, but and I've 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 looked at this software, okay? mm -hmm. and I could go into a Starbucks and see everybody's traffic that's using the Starbucks Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. But it's literally every piece of traffic, every single bit of garbage. It's this flood of data coming into my machine that I then have to figure out what to do with and possibly implement it. And if your password login was secured, I couldn't get your password. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sort of thing. So open Wi-Fi was, you know, you the chances of somebody snooping on you were minimal. Possible, but minimal. Here's what happens with FireSheep, though. FireSheep is a free open source plugin for Firefox. Okay. Now, I want to stress here, this is not a problem with Firefox. No. This is a problem with Wi-Fi. Okay. It just, it's a piece of software that works in Firefox. That's okay. created. That somebody created, created to work, work with Firefox. Yeah. So this is no reason to stop using Firefox. Okay. I, I want to make that perfectly clear here. Fire Sheep can be downloaded and installed, and actually, I, I've provided a link to it in the links. You can go to Google, type in Fire Sheep. You can go find it. It's not difficult. And what it will do, here's a screenshot of something I actually did. Okay? And I actually, I spied on myself. Okay? Um, I, 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 I was very hesitant to actually take this to, say, a Starbucks and start snooping on other people. There, yeah. there, there are legal and ethical issues here about using this software, okay? But what, if you look at this, this is my copy of Firefox running Fire Sheep over here in the sidebar, okay? And what I did was I logged into Facebook, Twitter, Evernote, Google, Foursquare, Flickr, mm -hmm. Yahoo, and Yelp, okay? I logged into all of these websites. And what has happened over here in Fire Sheep is it knows that I have logged into those other websites. And not only does it know I've logged into those other websites, it's actually pulled my name or username out of those websites. And it's pulled my avatar icon from each of those websites. Wow. Okay. So imagine what, what I could literally do is walk into Starbucks or Panera or the library with an unsecured Wi-Fi connection and I could see everybody else in the building who is logged into those sites, and I can see their name, and I can see their avatars. Okay. Not only can I see who's logged in, I could then click on one of those and immediately be logged into that service as them. There's the, the problem. There's the problem. <laughs> okay, so let, let's say Krista and I went to Starbucks. We both logged in on different computers. I could run Fire Sheep and see that Krista is logged into her Facebook account. Because what it's done is it finds that cookie that Facebook left on your, on your, on your computer because you're no longer secure. And it copies that cookie over to my computer, and I can now impersonate you. And I can completely hijack Krista's 
um, Facebook. Facebook account and change her password and do whatever I wanted with it because as far as Facebook is concerned, I am her. Post insulting messages about my mother. I, I could do yeah. whatever I wanted. Wow. Okay. This has always been kind of technically possible, but very difficult. You had to really be wanting to do it. Oh, I mean, a yes. Full on hacker guy. Yes, exactly. Way beyond yeah. my skill set. Okay. I might have been able to see she was on Facebook, but I couldn't necessarily get her password. Mm -hmm. And I would have really had to know what I was doing and know exactly what I was looking for to get your cookie and impersonate you and write some software to then take it over. This security expert literally wrote the software so it is now point and click. You install it, you go into the library, you go into the Starbucks, you get online, and you can take over somebody's session on a certain number of sites. And I see we have a, a yes. question that is coming. Yeah. Um, so uh, who wants to know, does the unsuspecting Facebook user need to be on Firefox as well? No. 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 That's a very good question. Yeah. The other user can be on any browser whatsoever mm -hmm. as long as they are connected to the Wi-Fi. Okay. So just being a Firefox user does not save you from this. Using another browser does not save you from this. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> this is scary stuff. <laughs> yes, it Okay, is. this is yes. very scary stuff. Uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. The question becomes, how can a user protect themselves from this? And or what can the library do or whoever's offering the f open Wi-Fi can do mm -hmm. to prevent this from working? Protect their customer yes. users. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to focus on what can the library do. Okay. okay. And it's actually very simple. Turn on what's called WPA security. It's Wi-Fi protected access. WPA security on your Wi-Fi hotspots. Okay. And give it a password. Now, I want to point out there's another form of security called WEP or WEP, completely useless and was broken years ago and can be gotten around in about 60 seconds flat without trying very hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you need to turn on WPA. Okay, and um, before I get to how to do that and in a little more detail, I forgot I added this slide this morning. I did a little survey on my website over the last couple of days. And I ask people in library land, um, what have you done because of this problem? Okay. The big giant purple area, which is more than 50%, was basically what's Fire Sheep and or WPA? <laughs> okay. Not a lot of people in the library world seem to know this. Now, it's a, well, it was a small Fire sample. Sheep, and Fire Sheep is very new. Fire Sheep so is, is less than a month. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, but two to three weeks now. Okay. Um, the, the green area was, no, we're not going to turn on WPA. So this is, these are libraries who have actually decided we're not going to do anything about this, which kind of scares me. Um, we have two categories of WPA was already on before this happened, okay? And um, uh, one other small sliver there that says yes as soon as I heard about it, and nobody responded, not yet, but we're working on it, okay? So this is why I'm doing this session, okay? So, what's going on here? Now, you're going to need to do this on your Wi-Fi router, and it will be, the instructions will be slightly different based on which brand of router you have. Okay. I know a lot of libraries in Nebraska have Linksys routers. They're the ones who we gave out through the grant, and mm -hmm. there are others. Okay. So, I'm just using this one as an example. Okay. You should be able to read your manual or online help for your router as to where to do this. Okay. Well, what I've done here on my link, sis, is I've gone to wireless and then wireless security. I've turned on WPA. And then there's different algorithms involved. And usually the, the strongest one is called TKIPAES. I am not going to get into explaining it. It's the <laughs> version of encryption that's being used. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then I gave it a password. And notice what I've said here under the, the balloon for number five. Okay? Feel free to pick an easy password for public access. Okay? I see we have some maybe other questions. Let me kind of finish this thought. Um, for example, if you're the library, you can make the password library. <laughs> okay. In other words, 
<laughs> and in fact, what some people have done is you, you get to name your Wi-Fi signal. Like mm -hmm. in Starbucks, it might be called Starbucks. In right. the library, it might be called the library. Some people have even suggested name your Wi-Fi signal library Wi-Fi. Password is library. Okay. okay. Like, give them the password in the name of the signal. Because what's going to happen is the moment you put a password on your signal, mm -hmm. Fire Sheep dies. Uh -huh. okay? It can't get around a password that is on the free Wi-Fi. Now, the people who still really know what they're doing and have the technical know-how and really want to break through this might still be able to get around it because you're back to the giving everybody the key makes it unsecure at a certain level. Mm -hmm. But having a key or a password on your Wi-Fi signal at all under WPA breaks FireSheep. FireSheep will not work anymore because it can't figure out the password to the Wi-Fi signal. So what I am telling and, everybody, yeah. yes, go ahead. Well, and then and what you're talking about that even by putting out your password, what it is, the people that really wanted to well, now they have it and they can do stuff. They could have done that anyways because they're the ones that know how to knew how to do this. Right. Before Fire I, Sheep I, existed. I, yes. It, yes. It's not that they said you suddenly given them an in that they no. didn't, couldn't have figured out and done before because they're the ones who are the experts that wanted right. to do this and be bad exactly. anyway. Right. Fire Sheep irrelevant. To right. Their situation. Yeah. No. Fire those Sheep those is, folks are not using Fire Sheep. Right. They already <laughs> have a way to do this, and <coughs> that's just something to deal with. Right. Um, Fire Sheep is mainly for the kind of. Um, Lazy hacker. Yeah, or... what, what would be kind of called script kiddies? Yeah. The, the, the people who go, oh, look, there's a tool that will do this for me. I'm going to try it out. Mm -hmm. I, I mean. And look, kind of, look, kind of, you know, look what kind of, to them, um, um, innocent damage I can do. Right. You know, the same kids mm -hmm. that think, you know, spray painting the side of your car is hee hee fun. You know, it, it's, 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 it's kind of an opportunistic exactly, use. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right, so right, what yeah, you want to do yeah. is you want to remove that opportunity. Um, did we have an outstanding question? Yes. I just wanted um, to check from yes. Dave, um, maybe. Yep, Dave. Next mm -hmm. um, he wants to know, after you leave and log off and they log off, do they still have the ability to access your accounts? Um, like, is it left behind? You know, that's a very good question. Um, qu quite possibly. Mm. It, it depends on whether the site deletes the gives you a different cookie each time uh. or keeps the cookie. Mm -hmm. um, so I would my my answer to that is I'm not 100 percent sure, but I believe it would be on a site by site basis. Because of what it actually is. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're on public Wi-Fi, I I've gotten into the habit of the last six months of logging out of everything and not having it remember me. And yes, mm -hmm. I have to type in my password a lot more often. I don't even have websites remember passwords anymore. I I kind of broke myself of that habit. Um, but I only do that at home because we have ours locked down. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but even at work, I log out of things. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm starting to get that on my laptops. I log out of things mm -hmm. um, oh. because somebody steals my laptop. I don't want it to be still logged yeah, in. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's kind of a, a thing like, like that. This, so yeah, this, I would not leave anything logged in here. Right. Not, exactly. While well, you're on someone computer, else's computer yeah. in this case. Most people that want an open Wi-Fi are going to be on their laptop. Mm -hmm. And, they you know, they have to remember. Day, yeah, yeah, exactly. So really, the, the I, my recommendation here is every library offering public access Wi-Fi needs to, and I'm, I, I, I'm sorry to say it, I've been saying for years you don't have to do this. I've completely changed my mind because of this. The you got to turn on WPA security, and you got to put a password on it. Make it a, a, a stupid, simple password. Make it library. Make it the number one. It doesn't matter for the point of view of fire sheet. Mm -hmm. okay. That's really what it comes down to. Okay. I don't want to walk into your library and be able to do this to your patrons. I don't want other people to be able to do this to their patrons. I thought about testing this at, at a local public library and I didn't. I only used it on myself. Okay. But this stuff is so easy to use that you've got to work around it. Now, what about you as a user? Okay. There's not a lot of options, okay? Option number one, don't use open, unsecured Wi-Fi. <laughs> well, that's not going to happen to... Yeah. I mean, you know, you're in an airport for three hours. You're probably using open, unsecured Wi-Fi. I mean, you know, there you go. 
Um, two, if you really get into it, this is what I do. I leave my computer on at home all the time. I actually remotely connect to my computer at home and then do the surfing on my home computer. It's called a virtual private network. Mm. And that way, my connection to my home computer is secured over an unsecured website or un unsecured Wi-Fi. Probably overkill for most people. Um, there are some anti-fire sheep software um, plugins out there for Firefox. Um, there are also some uh, plugins out there that will alert you if anybody else is using Fire Sheep on the network. Um, they're really stopgap. They're, they're not really helping you, I don't think, in my opinion. Um, the other one, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation just updated this software. I, I, I blogged about this before. I don't think I've talked about it in this show. Um, is a, if you are a Firefox user, there is a piece of software called HTTPS Everywhere. And when you turn this on in Firefox, if the website supports secure connections, even if it dumps you out of them, it will force you back into them. Hmm. So that in between okay. time, like in Amazon. Yeah. Sites. So, but it it's it's not a hundred percent, and it doesn't work in every website. Okay. Um, so it's a little something. It's it's better than nothing. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you know, right now your 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 only really good thing is only use websites uh, that secure everything uh, and or only use Wi-Fi that's secured via WPA passwords. Um, this software was released on purpose yes. to make people secure their Wi-Fi and to make websites secure their transactions. And I, I've provided some links, we'll show you the links at the end, to some podcasts um, from some security people that I listen to on a regular basis. and. He was literally thrilled that this software got released mm -hmm. because for years he's been saying people need to secure their Wi-Fi. And they're not. Yeah. And they're not. Yeah, but that's what I thought was interesting about this when I read it up on it. And I, I, I did the, the lazy thing, and I'm sure some librarians will cringe. I Googled it, and I found the Wikipedia mm -hmm. article about it. It was just a very basic overview of here's this new thing that knows up. And I thought it was very interesting that the, this was not someone who, who – the person who created this software – did not do it out of malicious um, nope. um, reasons. They, they weren't trying to say, ooh, look what I can, this horrible thing. They did it out of altruistic reasons. Yes. They wanted to say, look, this is something that can happen, and look, I've <coughs> figured out a way to make it easy for people. Everyone else, Somebody there, else better could do have figured something this out. about it. Mm -hmm. So it was for good reasons that they did it. It was yep. not to be, you know, a lot of this kind of thing that you hear about with, you know, viruses and malware and whatnot is because people want to be, dangerous and destructive. Yep. And this is the totally opposite reason, which I thought yep. was very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the last time I checked, actually, on the website where you can get the code for Firesheep, um, mm -hmm. you, you kid, there's a download counter. And last I checked, it was like over half a million downloads. Wow. Um, now, some of it are people like me who aren't really going right. to use it. Mm -hmm. But, Well, and the purpose know. for it was for, this guy said, was for people to get it and even use it to test and see, look, you're wide open. Use mm -hmm. it on your own local Wi-Fi to see how somebody could get into it. Yep. So it was like a testing software for <coughs> you at your library to get it and on purpose do this mm -hmm. and say, oh my gosh, what? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So here at the commission, we have public Wi-Fi, but it is password protected. You need mm -hmm. to ask us what it is. Mm -hmm. um, at my house, I have uh, Wi-Fi, um, which is not technically public. Um, but the, the name of my Wi-Fi is actually my house address because, you know, now my neighbors know where it's coming from. But I've actually okay. put a 63-character long random password on it. I just okay. did it because I could. <laughs> I, mean, I really, it's, trust me, it would take 30 million years to, to, to okay. figure out what my password is. But I keep it on a flash drive, and mm -hmm. it's just a little tech. And so if somebody comes in with a new laptop, I just copy it onto their machine and, and type it in. It. And I have had to type it in on iPods. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And and I've I've never had to type it twice. I've I, I've always been very careful, and I. But it's like numbers and letters and characters and punctuation and anyways. So wow. that's I literally did it to prove I could do it. That that's all. Um, so anyways, I mean that's 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 my talk about Fire Sheep and Wi-Fi security. Yeah, I do have time. one more question. One more question. Good. Well, another question. Another question. Like one, but um, are there other programs out there like Fire Sheep we should be aware of? I don't know what we mean by like. Mm -hmm. like not really not to people. this level. I mean, there there is a a another the the when I talk about the the people who really know what they're doing, mm -hmm. um, they're generally using a piece of software called Wireshark, hmm. um, which is the program that will literally grab everything it can out of the air, but it will yeah. literally dump 
tons and tons of data on your screen and you got to figure out what to do with it. Um, and I've used that to troubleshoot some things. I mean, I, I, I understand how it works in theory sort of thing. Um, but... And for a lot of them, they're doing, they're, made, they're doing their own thing, too. Yeah. Like they're programmers. They've created their right. own way exactly. of doing it. So mm -hmm. it's not really that there's other easy, quick, grab program. Like, there's tons of, I, mean, I don't know if I'd say millions or thousands of add-ons and, and plugins mm -hmm. for um, the Fire Firefox. Box. Firefox, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Too many fires. Um, and nothing this simple as this. Yeah, like no, in, this boom, nothing like this. Yeah. Um, Nobody's that, done this before. That's why it's a big if, deal. If you have a full-blown network administrator, they know about Wireshark. I mean, mm -hmm. I, they've probably even used it to, to troubleshoot your network. Yeah. Um, but, again, then you've got to know what to do with that data. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the difficult part. Yeah. So, um, but, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, no, nothing else I can think of that would really fall into this category of easy to use, mm -hmm. straightforward and available. So. Um, any other questions about this issue, Fire Sheep, um, Wi-Fi security? Um, please, everybody, today, tomorrow, well, not tomorrow, no. over the tomorrow. weekend, <laughs> talk to whoever runs your Wi-Fi. Make them listen to this, although we probably won't have the recording up until next Monday. We might. We, we might. Well, I'll, yes. I'll try to get this recording up this afternoon. If not, it will be up on Monday. I, we can guarantee that. Make them listen to this. Um, like I said, there's other links I'll, I'll show you at the end that, that you can get to. Um, we will provide the list, the, the, a link to the links in the recording, mm -hmm. yep. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, please, 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 please turn this on. Um, protect your patrons from this. This is, this is, this is big. Uh, I, I almost mm -hmm. didn't want to wait three weeks to do this. But I, well, you had to do a little it, research. I had to do some research. I had to get it to work. I had to spy yeah. on myself. Um, so... Okay, any other outstanding questions on this? No? Right now. Okay. Keep an eye on it. Yep. All right, so let's go on to my other topic. I, I'm going to kind of run through some of this a little quick because I gave a one-hour presentation on this, and it looks like I have about 25 minutes. So uh, I might have too many slides. We'll, we'll find out. But I want to talk about QR codes. Okay, and there's an example of a QR code. Um, let's do another quick little survey. Raise your hand if you've ever seen a QR code. I'm not asking you if you understand it. Just raise your hand if you've seen one of these before. Okay, so yeah, a little more than half, about 50%. Okay, all right, I'm going to put your hands down. Um, next question, how many of you actually have used a QR code before? Know what the heck's going on here? Yeah, Amy. Yes, I know you. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Sarah from Omaha. And Sarah from Omaha. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, just a few of you. All right, so let's talk about this. Okay, why am I giving this talk again? Basically because uh, I was away at an uh, internet librarian uh, last month in October, and, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this was also, was, was internet librarian before or after NLA? It was after NLA. Okay. So I gave a QR codes presentation at our state conference. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Internet Librarian. And on my way back, I had a layover at the Denver International Airport. Mm -hmm. uh, and I saw this. This is a giant, like, six-foot tall, 10, 14-foot wide illuminated sign next to an escalator. If you can kind of see the escalator running behind it there. Okay. And it read, free books. And there were QR codes to Treasure Island, Moby Dick, and the Art of War. Okay. Cool. I'm in the airport. I might have nothing to read. I might want to read a free book. Okay. Now, I'll explain how this works in a minute. But here's what got my eye. Please notice down here who is doing this. Bank. A bank. A local bank. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I should have labeled this sign library fail. Hmm. That should say Denver Public Book Library. library. Okay, yes, exactly. I mean, this is, you know, I, I don't know, do I, can I, I can highlight and write fail across this slide or something. I mean, this, 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 this just, I mean, I'd already been talking about QR codes. I'd already been encouraging people to use them. And then I saw this, and my brain about exploded. I was just like, this is so wrong. This needs to be done by the library. Now, can you afford to put an ad in the local um, airport? airport? Probably. Probably not, okay, but... It's, it's, it's signs like these, it's signs like free Wi-Fi at Wendy's 
that make me think, why is the library not doing this? Okay, so this is going to be kind of an upcoming crusade. I'm not sure what I'm going to do about it, but <laughs> this is stage one, okay? So let's talk about QR codes. It's a lot of people aren't necessarily sure. QR codes are what's known as a matrix barcode or a two-dimensional code. We're all familiar with UPCs, those little or barcodes, those lines, okay? In fact, if you're in a library, you know barcodes. Oh, gotcha. Okay, yes, you know barcodes, especially if you've ever done <laughs> processing or circulation. Okay, well, what a QR code is, is it kind of makes it into a square, gives it two dimensions instead of one, which are the lines and the thickness, gives it little blocks, and it can include way more information than a barcode can. Okay, a barcode, you have to have a certain set of lines for each individual character. QR codes can contain a lot more information than a barcode. Okay. Um, in fact, this is how much information. Okay? If you are um, just numbers, you can include up to over 7,000 characters worth of information. If you want letters and numbers, you can do over 4,200 characters. Binary, kanji, we're, we're not in Japan, we won't worry about those. But basically, you can carry about 4 to 7K worth of information in a single barcode. Okay. Uh, Question? Comment? Yeah, awesome. Uh, Jean uh, from Ohio County Public Library she said, I just used my phone to scan this. That was just cool. Like what you had on the screen. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's why I wanted to leave it on the screen a little bit to see if anybody could yeah, do that. She said this would be great for larger libraries. Not sure about small rural libraries. True. Okay, well, yeah. let me give you some examples, and, and, and we'll work with that. I'm going to run through a lot of examples here, kind of tell you how this works. Mm -hmm. By the way, I, I'm throwing this in. This, this is for the, 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 the uber geeks in the room who want to actually figure out how these things work. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over that. It's in the recording. You can come back to it. That's from the Wikipedia article, actually. Okay, what do you need? You're going to need some hardware, and you're going to need some software. Okay, basically any cell phone with a camera and the ability to install software that can interpret the code. Okay, so if you've got a, a, um, a, a dumb phone that has a camera, but you can't install applications, as Krista nods yes, her head, yeah. uh, that's fine. Um, that won't work. Camera, great, but no software. Right. Okay, so we're talking droids iPhones, Blackberries, you know, smartphones is basically what we're doing. Okay, and then what happens to the data depends on your phone too. Like, if it links to a website, you need a data plan so you can actually go to a website. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. Okay, um, software. Here's just some examples. Um, I actually use one called Barcode Scanner on my Android phone. Okay, um, QuickMark. There are others. I just pulled up a, a quick example here. You install those on your on your uh, device. Okay. And then um, you go find some QR codes. <laughs> okay, here's one actually that's in a store here in Lincoln um, that's uh, linking to Google, uh, and we're a favorite place on Google. Notice there's a QR code. So I go, hmm, I wonder what this is about. So what I do is I open up my phone, right? and if you look kind of in the upper right here, I have that barcode scanner software installed. So I bring that up. And this is a little hard to see, but you can see that kind of red line across there. Okay, it's almost like a Cylon kind of thing. Yeah. It's very faint. You know, it's on black. It's, it's hard to do screenshots from, of some of this stuff. Um, I would run that. I would get the red line, and then I would hold my camera up to the QR code. Now, this will read barcodes. This will also read QR codes. Okay? And what I would actually see in my window is what my camera is looking at. Unfortunately, my screenshot software would not show me what the camera is seeing. Oh, you need a camera to take a picture. I need a camera to take a picture of it. Yeah, I, I yeah. didn't go there. But good idea. I hadn't thought of that. Anyways, all right, so then what happens, and I, and I actually did, did scan a different example here, but in this case, it's a, it, the next screen comes up and it says, hey, this contains the following information, my name, for a person's name, person's email address, and um, URL. Okay? And notice over here on the left where it says type, it says address book, so what my software does is it says, hey, I noticed this is address information. Would you like to add this person as a contact to your phone? Would you like to send them an email? Okay. Or I can click on this URL and actually go to the website. Okay. Now just lots of examples I'm going to run through here. Here's one where it actually links you to a URL. Okay. And in this case, it happens to be a maps.google.com URL. Now what's real cool here is this is from a copy of Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. Mm -hmm. And what they've done is they put QR codes throughout the book. The special edition of it. Yes. They, they did okay. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I can now share this via text message, share this via email, or open it in my browser. And if I open it in my browser, actually this wasn't from that book, I'm sorry. <laughs> but this actually takes me to uh, a, a store on Essex Street in New York. 
Um, here is one where somebody actually um, uh, cross-stitched a QR code, uh, which links to their Facebook profile. Okay, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry, don't, and here we go, and it took me to Facebook on my phone. Um, this one here uh, links to a URL, which took me to a realty site. Okay, I was just talking to somebody, and um, Amy, it may have been you uh, in, in the audience, if I remember correctly, um, going around looking at houses, and if the house, yes, there's the flyer, but there's also a QR code. Uh, attached to the house so that you can um, get more information on your mobile device. Amy said yep. Yeah, okay, that was Amy. Good. Thank you very much, Amy. In Sonoma, she said it was. In Sonoma, all right. Um, here's one for uh, Gotham Guide. This is actually a travel guide around New York, okay? And that takes you to, in this case, it says viewer available. I'm like, oh, okay, well, let's view that. And what it actually did was it actually took me to an audio file about the building I'm standing in front of. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, here, this one was kind of cute. This was on a, I think, on a sticker that said "You are," and you had to read the QR code. And the it, the, the last one was next. They're just being cute. <laughs> so you are next. Um, also, there's another uh, application I have on my phone called AppRefer. This is just another use for QR codes. <clears throat> and <laughs> what this does, and I've actually done this with um, Angela at UNO. Actually, she also has an Android phone. Mm -hmm. Um, it pulled up a list of applications I have on my phone, and she went, oh, well, I want one of those apps. I said, okay, so I picked it, and it gave me a QR code for it, and then she took her phone, scanned the QR code, and it went to the store for that piece of software so she can install it on her phone. Cool. So you can, like, share. Right. So instead of saying, okay, go to the store, search for this, I just say, here's a QR code on my screen. Please scan it, and then she has it. Hmm. So I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, now library ideas. What can we do with um, libraries? I have some examples. Um, here are some other ones. Hours, branch locations, call number locations, tours, art descriptions. These are all ones I've heard about, and I have some actual examples. Here's UNL libraries. Okay, I was actually at Love Library about a month or so ago, maybe two months ago. And um, I, in this case, what it did was it linked to the hours. So this was on the door. Lincoln City Libraries also does this. They have QR codes next to their hours, and you can bring that up. So all they're doing, literally, they're not putting all the hours into the QR code. They're linking, they're linking to a web page which has right. the hours. Exactly. Um, oh, in fact, here's Bennett Martin, Lincoln City Libraries. There's their QR code, and again, that uh, links off to their website. This one was pretty cool. This photo I took actually got featured in an issue of American Libraries Direct. Um, this was, it's, it's a little table talker, Okay. And it's got a QR code on it. It says, hey, you know, uh, we have health and wellness resources at lincolnlibraries.org. Then click on research tools. Then click on research resources. Or scan this QR code, and it took my phone right to their databases. Wow. Right on my phone. Okay. Now, how well the databases work on a phone, that's up to the vendor. Well, that's, yeah. <laughs> that is not related to this. But I got there. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so I scanned that, and it took me right to their researches page. Okay. Um, Topeka and Shawnee County Library, which those of you who um, uh, know this show know we've, we've talked to David Lee King, who's the head of their digital initiatives out there, their digital branch, excuse me. Uh, I use them as an example a lot. They're doing a big read of the Maltese Falcon, and they're actually having a QR code-based scavenger hunt around the city. The whole city? Uh, yeah. I've not, I've not looked into this much more uh, yet. I, I, I've been really busy, but I just I think that's totally cool. I need to call David and say, what's up with this? Get that okay. um, here's another cool example that I found on Lifehacker. Um, these are um, uh, um, flashcards that you can't cheat on because the answer, you have to scan with your phone to get the answer. The answer is not on the back side of the card. So this person actually made QR codes of just text of what all the answers were to their their um, their uh, flashcards. Huh. Okay. So you know, there you go, another interesting idea. Here's the around the world in 80 days example. Okay, this is a, the, a, a publisher called UbiMark, um, and you literally, as you're reading along, you can scan QR codes. Uh, I scanned one that was connected to a map on my screen. What it literally did was it took me to a Google Map. Of where the balloon is at that time during the during the, the story, so I you know, kind of interactivity sort of thing. 
Okay. Uh, and then I can get uh, more information and it tells me, you know, it, over a thousand people had already viewed that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was being yeah, used. Cool and we're at 7 there. Saville Row and usually you get a little balloon icon and they, they pretty much customized that uh, pretty darn well. That is pretty cool in making the whole story interactive. Trying to make it a little more interactive. Yeah, that you exactly. Can, yeah. Uh -huh. um, scan another one and this actually took me to... Um, the online text. So if I'm on chapter 28 and I've got, well, you know what, I'm going to put the book down, but I'm going on the road, I can scan with my phone and pick up where I left off. Some different ideas. Another book that's come out with uh, some uh, QR codes in it is a book I'm, I'm currently reading called I Live in the Future and Here's How It Works. And what they've done is they've actually, in the beginning of each chapter is a QR code connected to a website about that chapter mm -hmm. and discussion forums and whatnot. Uh -huh. um, so a little less Interactive in a different way. I don't want to say less interactive, but interactive in a different way. Um, and in fact, uh, I even pulled up, I, I found a picture of this book, and even the Kindle format of the book has the QR codes built in. Okay, so I though there's something weird to me about the idea of holding an electronic book and scanning something with your phone so you can get it on your phone from the electronic book. You know, <laughs> there's just, just kind of yeah. some sort of recursiveness starts <laughs> happening there and the, the, the world explodes. Um, but anyways. So um, wow, those blue on black are really bad. Don't yeah, worry about it. I, I have. Were you not thinking? I was not thinking. I, I do have all these links in Delicious. We'll show you. Yeah. But um, there's lots of websites out there where you can generate your own QR codes. It's really easy to do. Literally, it's filling out a form. Okay. Um, and if we do post up these PowerPoint slides for the presentation, I will make Michael change this before we put this live. Uh, yeah, that's probably not a bad <laughs> idea. But let me let me bring up one of them here just to show you an example. Um, literally, this is the QR code generator from the Zing project, and you basically get a question, for example, do you want to do contact information, a calendar event, a, a, a phone number, uh, send just plain old text, a link to a URL. So let's say I want to link to a URL, okay, and we're just going to link to, uh, whoops, I got my caps lock on. nlc.state.ne.us, and I want a large barcode, maybe a small or medium. I just click generate, and there is my large barcode. That is now just an image. I can save that image. I can copy and paste it. I can print it. I can do whatever I want, and literally now somebody scans that code, and it gives them the ability to link directly to that URL. I have one on my homepage of my website. That's contact information. So you can get my name, my email address, you know, I could include my phone number, my, you know, other things like that. Literally, that's all you need to do. That's the cool thing, too, is that, like, someone like me with a dumb phone, I can create a QR code for me, my contact yes. information, my personal blog, website, whatever, and put it out there for people to get to me, but it's not, like... You yeah, know, it's not what you to create them. It has nothing to do with what software you have and what phone you have. Right, exactly. It's just to access them yep. afterwards. Yep. Yeah. Um, I've seen lots of other. Uh, I've seen and heard about lots of other interesting examples. Um, Love Library at UNL um, has also got one set up. That, you know, it's one of these old university libraries where there are like half floors and east side, west side, and you can mm -hmm. get lost in this very easily. You can set it up, so, they've got it set up so that if you're on a floor, you can scan a QR code and then get a map of the floor of where everything is so you where um, you on your phone so you can take the map with you uh, on your phone. Um, I've heard of examples where they're adding QR codes to the OPAC mm -hmm. so that you scan the code for the book and it will show you then, it will bring up a map of where the book is in the building, in the building uh, and possibly directions, which gets interesting depending on where you're scanning the code. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to somebody else where they were going to have their library work with the local historical society mm -hmm. to put QR codes. This is Jasmine. In fact, we'll be talking to her in January. Mm -hmm. um, to work with the local historical society to put up QR codes on historical buildings, oh. but have the information hosted by the library mm -hmm. on their website so that you scan the QR code in the building and it links you back to the library that has information about the building. Okay. Um, you got to reach out, and that's from making yeah, yeah, connections yeah. with the rest of your exactly. community, making the library the heart of the community. Um, U.S. parks have started putting QR codes on their signs. Like out in the park? Oh, oh, like Yellowstone, I think, was one of the examples. And and you scan the QR code, and you get a video from YouTube of a, uh, a park ranger telling you about where you're standing. 
All right. I mean, you know, take the park ranger with you. Yes, phone. exactly. <laughs> Literally, take the park ranger. Now, you know, this assumes you have a data connection to your phone yeah. in Yellowstone. Right. But you know, you never know. Uh, but it seems to work, or else they wouldn't have done it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So you know, Yellowstone seems to be covered. I mean, the possibilities here are basically: what information do you think your patrons might want on their mobile device? Mm -hmm. If you can find an answer to that question, you can generate a QR code that will do it. I mean, basically, that's it. I mean, just think I, creatively. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and what's funny is, is all it's going to take, and I realize nobody has any of this, but it's not going to take any money. It's just going to take some time. Mm -hmm. You got to make the codes. Yeah. I don't want to know it's how free. Yeah. the person who created the um, the, the flashcards. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know how long it took them to create <laughs> all those QR codes individually mm -hmm. and copy and print them and then paste them on it. I mean, it was work, but it didn't cost anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the thing. All these code generators, all this is free. Mm -hmm. there's, no, exactly. there's no software to purchase. or Yeah, you know, like with my Wi-Fi grant, I got so excited about public Wi-Fi, I could offer a grant. There's no grants here. You don't need it. There's these <laughs> you just need to make a grant for the time. Right? Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I mean, grant to hire somebody to do it. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> uh, but I'm, if you got any ideas as to how we can help uh, you Nebraska mm -hmm. libraries with this, please let me know. If anything, you know, give me a call, send me an email. I'll talk to you more about it. There are ideas mm -hmm. out there that uh, we can uh, share with you. Um, just real quick, um, there are a couple other types of codes out there. Uh, there's what's called a micro QR code. Um, these are usually used for like inventory and sort of thing. They only hold 35 characters. Okay, And then Microsoft, because Microsoft always has to do their own thing. Um, this is actually kind of cool, though. Um, they call it the high capacity color bar code. And I have an example right here on the screen. Um, it uses triangles instead of squares. Um, and uh, it uses color, and it can, it's actually, as far as I can tell, infinitely expandable. QR codes have an upper limit. Hmm. Okay, you can just keep making these ones bigger with more triangles, and it can contain up to thirty-five hundred characters per square inch. Wow. Okay. Well, because once you add, you know, triangles take up less space, and then once you add color. You can do Even that. More, right, yeah. exactly. And if, if if you install a piece of software like Microsoft Tag, um, you can do this. However, I've never seen these in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, QR tags, though, are out there, QR codes. Once you see them, you'll just start looking. Ads in airports, like every other ad in that airport had a QR code yeah, in the corner. Every, it's got, I, becoming like standard, just slapping QR code on uh -huh. your ad to link to your website. Magazine ads. Yeah. Just start, I haven't seen them on television yet, um, but I have seen them at the end of YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. I've seen them at the end of movie trailers. Um, in YouTube. I've seen them in movie theaters on scan this barcode and then take it up at, to for free popcorn or something. I mean, it, it's uh -huh. they, yeah. they're out there and you're going to start mm -hmm. seeing more and more of them. Big in Asia first, really starting to pick up here in, in the States. So, um, any, and, and I kind of cheated here, um, <laughs> you know. I'll show you where the links are, but for those of you, I'll leave this up for a minute. Uh, if you want my contact information or if you want uh, a link to the links on your phone, I know at least one person in the audience can scan these. Yeah, uh, I'm sure to Gene did it before. <laughs> I know Amy can, um, probably a few others. We'll um, have a traditional page. Yes, well, as well, right? we, yeah, we, this is just my, you know, I, it, now that you know how to do you this, to use it. exactly, here's another example. Um, any questions? Is there any uh, already come in, Krista? Uh, nothing or, new. Nothing new? Um, okay, uh, we start about five minutes late. Yeah, I have about five more minutes. Let me show you the links and talk about one other thing. Um, here is uh, the links to uh, my version of, of uh, on my delicious account. Um, for the official archive, we will also copy these over to uh, the Commission's Delicious account and have an official link to this. But right now, delicious.com slash travel librarian slash tech talk plus November 10, which is 2010, not November 10th. Um, so if you want to see previous ones, it's tech talk plus October 10, uh, September SEPT 10, I think, things like that. Uh, or just Tech Talk without the date, and you'll get all of the stuff I've talked about in Tech Talks. Um, the one other thing I wanted to talk about real quick is Google made an announcement like Monday, I think, where they're going to have a feature, they haven't released it yet, that will allow you to work on your Google Docs in Office. Oh, I saw a headline. Okay, yes. yes. Yes, but it's not out yet. They've okay. just announced it. It's like internal testing sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. This to some people is super uber cool, okay? Because then you don't have to go to Google Docs, you just open it up in Office and it 
downloads it from Google Docs, allows you to edit, and will allow you to actually co-work on things while you're in office with that. Really, really cool if you're a Google Docs user. If you're impatient, there's already something I've been using for over a year that lets you do practically the same thing. Mm -hmm. Called Office OffiSync, uh, which I will bring up here. OffiSync.com. Um, and what this will allow you to do, it won't allow you to co-work on documents in Office. Mm -hmm. But it will allow you to edit anything from Google Docs in Office. Mm -hmm. So basically it gives you another uh, ribbon toolbar for Office Sync. And you say, show me what's in my Google Docs account. It logs in, it shows you, you open it, it downloads it, you edit it, you click save, it sends it back. Right. Um, so ultimately, and it's free, see, free download. Um, ultimately, the Google version might be better. I don't know. It's not out yet. Out, yeah. But I know people have been reading about this, and I just want to let you know that there's something that will practically do this already. Mm -hmm. um, I've been using it for over a year. It's really handy. Um, that way I don't have to, I, you know, usually Office is open on my computer. I don't have to go off to Google Docs uh, to edit that. So that's kind of my one other oddball, not necessarily big news, but news that you uh, might want to be aware of. Okay. Questions, co <laughs> comments, concerns. Um, I'll go back to the links page. Uh, pretty much everything I talked about. Um, I will also point to episode 272 of Security Now, which is the podcast I was talking about. Um, that's one where they specifically talk about FireSheet for the majority of the program. Uh, episode 273 um, is what they call a Q&A episode, and some people have some questions about FireSheet that he kind of clarifies some things. So you might want to listen to episode 272 and 273. If you have any interest or um, uh, involvement in computer security at all, listen to the Security Now podcast. I, I, I've been listening to it for five years now. Um, it is a lot of podcasts. If, if I miss an episode, I just, oh, well, I missed the episode and I go on. This one, I don't miss an episode. I, in fact, I just got caught up with a four-week backlog of, <laughs> of, of these episodes. I listen to this. These guys are, it's Leo Laporte hosts it. Um, I've just totally forgotten. Uh, Steve Gibson is the security guy. He's a genius, and he can explain things that make sense to people who are not super nerds or mm -hmm. super geeks. Uh, if I understand it, you can understand it too. Sometimes, though, you do have to listen to some things like, wait a minute, back up, say that again. Um, but really good. If you want a little, if you want more uh, technical detail about Fire Sheep and why WPA beats it and, and kills it, that podcast will explain it. So, cool. you know, anybody else. Um, I explained it to the best of my ability. Uh, if you want more detail, listen to that one. I will specifically point out. Any other questions, outstanding, um, or comments? No, doesn't look like it. Huh? Um, and I, I took up my hour. Yeah. We did have a, a comment back sort of on Twitter. Um, uh -huh. may, if you notice at the beginning, we have our slides. Um, we do have a um, hashtag for Encompass Live that we use and sometimes during the session when I'm on here I will tweet out interesting things just to say what we're talking about yeah. and I sent out the link to that photo of the bank picture of the QR codes in Denver Ooh. Airport and um, we do have a comment from someone, uh, or someone we may know, uh, uh, Karen Dalziel uh -huh. here in Lincoln. Um, those books, and I was going to mention it when this picture was up, and then we kind of went past it, and so I didn't get to it. Um, she said, uh, free read on us, ha, 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 way to use the public domain bank. Those books that were on that, that that's one thing I was going to mention, those are all the kind of the books that are in, they're, they're free, not that the bank paid something to get access for them for you. They're public domain already. They're, they're showing yeah. that, if you notice the titles, they're, they're not copyright protected. They're out there free anyways. So the bank didn't do anything special to get you access. They just get... made the QR codes and set it up. And so that's the kind of thing you can do, too, at your library. You don't have to pay to get access to special books. There are ones that are already out there that you can just create QR codes for. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and in fact, I, if I remember correctly, I tried one, and it, even, it, it doesn't even link to, I'm trying to remember, I think it linked to a bank web page. Mm-hmm. Which then linked you to the book on Project Gutenberg. Yeah, Project Gutenberg. Yeah. <laughs> Go there, find the link, use it. You know, and even you know, see, in our case at a library, I'm sure we would um, give credit in that way. Say, 
Get oh, this on Project Gutenberg. Actually, no, I wouldn't even do that. I, I, I would go one step further. They're in the public domain. Yes. And, and Project, well, okay, I would, give, I would give credit for Project Gutenberg. Yes. But what I would actually do is I would download a copy to the library's website. Yeah. Because, because probably, in, yeah. in the book file, it says from Project Gutenberg. So right. their credit is there. Right, yeah. I mean, so, or, you know, to be honest, you know, it says, you know, instead of having it say First Bank, have it say, you know, Lincoln Public Libraries, Lincoln City mm -hmm. Libraries, and link directly to the book. Mm -hmm. Don't make them go to the library website and then click on another link to get the book. Mm -hmm. Just link to the darn book. Yeah. You've got, you kind of got the credit you don't there. The movie, you yeah. know, that's yeah. the... And, but that was just, yeah. Yeah. And I thought it was cool that Karen mentioned this as something I wanted to say when the slide was up, but we went on to other things. Yeah, these are public domains. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I've been meaning to write a blog post, and then I decided to talk about it here, but I, th I think I still will. I, and, and I will sure. probably add library fail on to this and... <laughs> Um, because, yeah, there's just, it's a spectacular idea, and why didn't we mm -hmm. think of it? And if we thought of it, why aren't we doing it? Yeah. I mean, that's really what it what it probably comes we down to. We should be. Borrow the yeah. bank's idea. Thanks, bank. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, we just have a couple of people that said thanks. It's been fun. Uh, someone had to log off. said great session. All right. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Um, as I said, this has been recorded and will be available maybe this afternoon. We'll see what we can get going. How quick it gets uploaded. Yeah. <laughs> right, yes. Um, and we hope you'll join us next Wednesday, December 1st, oh, in December, um, where we will have our uh, what we're calling Fall Conference Roundup, our next Encompass Live session. Um, the Library Commission provides grants to library staff around the state to attend conferences they may want to go to. And we have a couple of people who have attended um, a couple of conferences, one about circulation and one about um, volunteer coordinators conference and they're going to talk about their experiences at these two conferences and getting the grants and everything so that will be our next one next wednesday 10 a.m so uh hopefully we'll see some of you there that's it nothing that's right. that's it yes thank you everybody so, for attending thank you very um oh oh, oh. that's nice oh laura says happy happy thanksgiving oh yeah and happy yes, happy. Oh, yes. <laughs> so i almost forgot that that's tomorrow i got so wrapped up in all this yes, oh. happy thanksgiving thank you for coming and showing up the day before um, I guess you all have to be at work, so do we. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Dave McStorff of South City, this is the most informative webinar I have ever attended. Wow. Uh oh. <laughs> we're gonna I'm, take that. I'm in trouble to, next like, month. Bring that somewhere. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna have to. How are you gonna I'll have to interview Dave. <laughs> no, we've already done that. Yes, right? Yes. Okay. okay. So. All right. Thanks again. Yep. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Bye bye. Bye.